Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Feeling good? Come on. Yeah. Woo. Some of you are thankful for an extra hour of sleep. Come on. Anybody? Amen. I don't know about you, but I woke up a little tired this morning, and so I've had, I think, four cups of coffee. You know, four cups. So I don't know if you beat me on that, but I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Fired up. Um, but no, uh, I have just a couple of announcements before we get to the message for today in this new series that we're in. Uh, but first is, is that this Friday, we have uh, something around here that we call Be, Be Loved, which is uh, a women's night that we're going to be doing. And uh, Pastor, yeah, come on. Some of you ladies are excited. Uh, Pastor Gretchen is going to be speaking at that. And so we're excited to hear what she has to say. And so that'll be November 8th at 630. Here's what you need to know. It's free. You also don't have to sign up. You can just show up. Uh, and I just tell you, if you're a lady, uh, then invite a friend and, and come and experience that. It's going to be great. If you're a dude, don't show up. All right. Uh, but it, it, it's going to be great. Hopefully you can make it. Um, and then lastly, uh, if you at any point this year, uh, or maybe even in the past, uh, have made a decision for Christ and yet to have, and you haven't yet taken the next step of baptism, we have that coming up as well on November 10th. And so if you would like to sign up for that, we would love to, to come alongside you in that decision as you go public with your faith. And so if you'd like, you can uh, click that uh, or you can take a photo of the QR code in front of you. Or uh, if you go out into the lobby, uh, there's a next steps table out there. Uh, and that's a great place for you just to say, hey, I'm interested. Um, and a matter of fact, just for fun, you should go see the new table that has been created for Next Steps. It's been great. Uh, we had uh, a guy in our church named Chad. Uh, he built this whole new table, and it's really cool looking. I'd love for you to go see it. Uh, and at the same time, you can sign up for baptism. Come on, it'd be great. Um, but anyway, uh, those are the two announcements I have for you just to draw your attention uh, to a few of those things. But I did want to kind of just say this. Uh, I know that... that that I guess two days from now, two days from now, we have uh, a, an election. And um, I know that some of you uh, have been working on that and talking about that. And some of you have been trying to ignore it altogether. Uh, so I get it. Uh, but I did want to just pause for a moment and pray uh, just that the Lord's will would be done. And so if you wouldn't mind, uh, I, I'd like to offer a prayer for our nation. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega, that you are the beginning and the end, that your word says that you're Lord Almighty. That means that you hold the whole world in your hands. You made it. You keep it. And so, God, as we make our way to the ballot box as a nation, we pray that you would help us to make wise de decisions in who we vote for, wise decisions in what we vote for. We ask for your help to know what is right and good and pleasing in your sight as we go about the business of being citizens. But Lord, most of all, we just remember that you are king. You are over all things. And we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we are starting a series that we do annually around here uh, called, and th this year we're calling it Hashtag Blessed, all right? So Hashtag Blessed. Um, and this entire series is really uh, a series on generosity, a series on giving and how the connection between giving and blessing and all of that kind of co together and, and, and that type of thing. And so if you're kind of disappointed that you showed up today, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know that some of you are like, well, I'll be back in December. You know, I'll be back at Christmas time. You know, I, I don't particularly want to hear this message and I get it. Because the truth is we live in a world that doesn't really want the church to talk much about it. You know, we just do. Uh, the problem is that Jesus talked a lot about it. I mean, and so like if the church doesn't talk about it, then we're kind of not talking about what Jesus talked about. And that's not, that doesn't seem good to me, right? Uh, and so again, this isn't, a, this isn't because the church necessarily wants something from you, which I'll get to in just a second. It's much more about how do we understand God's uh, scriptures? How do we understand the principles of God and how they relate 
to this area of generosity and giving and all of those kinds of things of stewarding well what God has given us and all of that. Like, that's an important thing to discuss. And so my hope as we go through this series is that you would open yourself up to this possibility that God wants to, to, to show you something. God wants to address maybe a barrier you have like something that's actually standing in the way of you experiencing the blessings of God because you don't want to go past it. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that we all bring to this particular series, but, but my heart is to do this every year. Like every year we do five weeks on this because I believe that the Bible talks a ton about it. And is if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, you have to deal with this. You have to wrestle with this. And can I just be honest? I really felt like the Lord said, bring it straight and strong today. All right. Now, some of you are happy about that. Some of you are not going to be so happy about that. And, and, and I just want to go on record and say, hey, uh, there, we have an email around here called, I think it's God at ElevationSTL.com. And you can send your complaints to that. Uh, <laughs> Don't send it to me. Uh, I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. All right? And so be mad at that. But I do, I do desperately want the church to get this, uh, both personally and corporately, because if we do, uh, guys, the lid comes off. It comes off of your life individually, and it comes off the church. And, and, and so when we receive this particular revelation that you'll get through this series— I promise you God is going to move in ways that you can't think or imagine. And that's what the scripture tells us. So let me start here today. And I, I want to ask you this question. And it's just a very straightforward question. And matter of fact, I usually know what the answer is. But here's the question. Would you rather be blessed or cursed? Right? Like you pick, you pick. Which one? Now, I've never had anybody be like, you know, I'm really liking that curse thing. That's, that's where I'm, that's kind of where I'm, that's my lane. Uh, really want to be there. Uh, nobody does that. Everybody's like, I, I, I much prefer blessing versus cursing. Because curses are things like you want to get rid of. They're not things you want to keep. And, and, and so when I say that, everybody in the room, you, you almost 100% says, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. Do you want to be blessed? I want to be blessed. Like everybody wants to be blessed. So this idea is very universal. Here's the thing that's so exciting about this, that the Bible has a very strategic, calculated, principled way, path for you to be blessed. Like it's very straightforward. This is why I love preaching about this, because it's one of those things that you know that God said he's going to do it. God can always be trusted. So therefore, if I do it the way he wants me to do it, it's coming my way. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a great, great situation to be in. A great situation to be in. Now, when I say blessed, Sometimes people know like what I mean. Sometimes you might have your own definition, but I wanted to start with what I would say is a biblical definition of blessed. Here it is. The biblical definition of blessed is that you have the supernatural power of God, the supernatural power of God working in your life. We all need it. When we try to do it in our natural, it doesn't work as good. So we need the supernatural power of God working in our lives. And if I said, do you want that? Everybody would be like, yeah, of course I want that. Who doesn't want that? Of course you want that. I want that. You want that. We all want that. Now, here's the thing. This is the, the truth, the, the principle that I felt like God put in my heart to share today. And, and I'll, I'll share it with you. And, and again, this is just something that as I prayed about it, here's something that I think is a sad truth. Now, I just shared with you a truth, which is blessed means to have a supernatural power of God on, on your life. 
working in your life. Here's a sad truth. Everyone wants to be blessed, but not everyone is willing to do what God has told us to do in order to receive that blessing. Let that sit there for a second. We all want it, but it doesn't mean that we're willing to do what we're told to do in order to get it. That makes sense? This is the thing that I've been wrestling about. This is the thing that I wanted to share with us today because what I'm asking us to consider is that maybe, just maybe, that if we will press through this, if we'll press through this not doing it, that on the other side of it is exactly what we're looking for. That, that it's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, and, and, and now here's the deal. Uh, I don't want necessarily anything from you. Like I'm doing good. Like, I mean, I'm blessed. Like I, the Lord has blessed me in so many ways. I honor the Lord where I'm supposed to honor him. My family is blessed. My life is blessed. Now that doesn't mean everything's good all the time, right? Doesn't mean that. I mean, life happens, but you can be blessed and still be in a bad place. You can, you can be blessed and still be in a hard place. The thing is, is like, we always assume that blessing means money. Blessing so much more than that. Like, you know, health could be a blessing to you. You know, uh, your, your kids, loving God could be a blessing to you. I mean, I don't know, but, but there's blessings that God wants to bring that have nothing to do with money. Now, it, it does have to do with money, but it has so much, it has, it's so much bigger than that. But here's the thing is I don't really want anything from you, but what I really do as your pastor is I want something for you. Not from you, but for you. So when I talk about blessings and my desire to teach on this is because I want this to be true of your life. I want this to be something that you see happen in your life. That God is for you and he wants to bless you. That he has things for your family. He has things for you individually. He has things for your church. He has things for your work. He has a lot for you. And when you get the supernatural power of God, the blessing of God on your life, working on your life, can I just say, isn't it true that if you get that, it makes it better? I, I'm just saying if, it, if that's true, and I think it is, that it makes things better doesn't always make it easy, right? Because doing the right thing ain't easy, right? right? Like, I mean, you remember what I just said about like everybody wants it, but nobody's willing to do it or few people are willing to do it. That's a reality. That may be your reality. But at the end of the day, I, I hope today that God would get you off high center, that would get you, maybe shake you a little bit so that you might just maybe just see this truth because I truly believe God wants to bless you I believe he wants to bless this church. I believe he wants to bless the church. I believe he wants our vats to overflow. I believe he wants our barns to increase at such a size that we can't contain it all. Why? So that we can make a difference in this world at a level that it's never been done. Because see, we're blessed to be a blessing. And when we get this revelation, everything starts to happen the way that God wants it to happen. So this entire series is about something very simple that I want you to be blessed. That's what I want for you. I want the supernatural power of God released and working in your lives and on your resources. That is my heart as we go through this series. And I just know that some things are gonna get stirred up in us today. Some things are gonna get stirred up in us today that God wants to look at, that God wants to help us with, uh, especially if it has anything to do with, no, nah, I'm good. Like if it has anything to do with, no, nah, I'm good. I just want to encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus today, pr please press through that, no, nah, I'm good. Because on the other side of that is a place of obedience. It's a place of doing what God told you to do. And God always comes true or comes through on what he promises to do. But can I be really honest? It's not gonna happen if we're passive towards it. 
In other words, we have to reject passivity towards what I'm talking about and embrace an activity like that we are actively moving towards this principle, pursuing God and the things of God in this particular area, and God promises to do his part. I don't know if you've ever read the book of James, uh, but listen to what James says in James chapter 1, verse 22. He says, but don't just listen to the word of God. You must, what does it say? Do what it says. So don't just, don't just listen but actually do what it says. And then he says this, listen, otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. You know what the Bible says about a fool? A fool is somebody that knows the truth and doesn't do it. That's actually what a fool is. That's how the Bible defines a fool. A fool is somebody that makes excuses. A fool is somebody that that blames others and things rather than applying the word of God to their life. In other words, you receive the word that is coming to you today. You take it in, you receive it, and by faith, you put it into action. That is what the Bible would describe as a wise person. And the opposite is foolish. That's not what we want. We want something completely different. But let me pause here for a moment because this whole series is about doing something. But I have to stop for a moment and just make sure that we're clear. And here's what I want to be clear on. The blessing of salvation is not something you work for. The blessing of salvation that comes to people is by faith in Jesus and what he's done for you on the cross. The Bible says that you don't have any righteousness, that Jesus gives you his righteousness, his perfect righteousness. You receive it and now you have it because he gave it to you by faith. Okay, that's true. But what happens is when God saves us, we now are given an invitation into a life of blessing, a life of being transformed into the image of Christ. And if all we have today is salvation, What I want to say to you is you're being invited, you're being invited, you're being invited into something different. God never called us to just sit and be saved. God called us to be saved and begin to move towards the things of God in obedience to what he says. And so today's message is going to be all about the obedience side. Like it's the, it's the action side. But I just wanted to make sure we were clear about the blessing of salvation because the blessing of salvation is something that comes to us because of something Jesus has done. And that's why this is so important that we make this. It's this we make this distinction because my point earlier was that we're not doing something. And because we're not doing it, it's not happening. And that is very much biblical as well as we think about what God wants to do in our lives. So faith is enough for the blessing of salvation. But without faithfulness, there will be no increase of blessing in your life and in your resources. Faith, faithfulness. Faith is your access to salvation. Faithfulness is your access to blessing. And faithfulness is predicated on obedience to the things that God has already said where I take that in and I say, God, I'm going to do that because you said I need to do it and I'm not going to be passive about it. And so I don't know if you're excited about this today. Uh, I hope you are. I hope you're excited about what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, So, but but, but I, I really hope that you'll take the next five weeks and invest yourself here. And, and let me just say this, find out if I'm not telling the truth, like actually go on the journey with me. Don't just say, oh, he's just a preacher. He has to say that stuff. No, no, go on the journey with me and see, and see if God won't meet you there. Because you know what? The Bible says he promises to meet you there. It's the only place in the scripture when we talk about giving, it's the only place in the scripture where God says, test me in this. That's what he says, which we're going to talk about throughout the series. But just, just so you know, it's kind of a big deal that God wants to meet us here And so everybody wants to be blessed, but not everybody's willing to do what God has told them to do to receive that blessing. 
Well, I hope you're excited, but I want to give you the first principle today. In order to unlock the supernatural favor or to have it working in your life and on your resources, the first thing you need to understand is this. Listen, is that everything belongs to God. Now, some people hear that and they think, yeah, duh, right? Some people hear that, yeah, duh, but they don't live that way. Like they hear it, they may even agree with it, but they don't necessarily live that way. And then some of you, that may be new information. And that's okay. I, I hope all of us are kind of entering into this pool because we have to understand this principle that everything we have, everything we have, everybody say everything. everything. Everything we have is a gift from God. Everything we have came from the Father of light who blesses his children and showers his kids with gifts and blessings. All of it is a gift from God. Is a gift from God. He owns it all. He's the owner. He's the owner of everything. He created it. He gets to own it. And you know what's so cool about God? Is he owns it, but he lets us borrow it. Like he owns it, he lets us borrow it. And, and we're going to talk about that too. But, but it's so amazing that God lets us use his stuff. God lets us be blessed by our very proximity to him that we get to receive the blessings of God because of who he is. And I just love that. But let me ask you this, or let me, let me say this statement, is our perspective on ownership, like in other words, if I see that God owns it, it actually has an effect on me. So if I start with God owns it, there are certain things that come to pass in my life at an easier rate, or it's an easier way for it to come to pass. Uh, when these things are true, when I get this one right. And that is that ownership determines not only our dedication to giving, but also our discipline to be good stewards of what we're given. Now I'm gonna unpack that in just a moment, but I want you to see that dedication and discipline, that my dedication is uh, attached to whether or not I believe it's all God's. Because if I believe it's all God's, my dedication to give him what is his is a lot easier. But if I believe, listen, if I believe it's mine, do you see how it affects my dedication? Come on now. If I believe it's mine, God, you don't understand. I worked hard for this. Huh? You don't get it, God. Whether or not we see that God is the owner absolutely affects our dedication to give what belongs to him. Sometimes I think about this. To be fully surrendered to God. Like, what does it mean to be fully surrendered? Like, have you ever felt like you're partially surrendered? Like there's, you know, but there's a few things that aren't quite there yet. Like, I feel that way sometimes where there are things in my life that aren't surrendered to God and I know it. And he, he in a kind, generous, loving way, he comes to me and he says, Daniel, we got to get this right. We got to deal with that. I want you to be more like Jesus today, right? And so God does that. But I was thinking about this fully surrendered idea to God. Like if, if I'm fully surrendered to God, then that means, that means that if he tells me to do it, I do it, right? I mean, does that make sense? If I'm fully surrendered to God, he says, do it, and I say, yes, sir. He says, do it, and I'm just like, I'm in. Because I'm fully surrendered. I'm fully dedicated to you. But I don't know if you know this, but human beings, we kind of have a pride issue. Did you know that? Like, did you know that we struggle with pride? It's true, you know. Now, some of you have a hard time admitting it, right? But just try to get you to say you were wrong about something or say you were sorry. I mean, you know what I mean, right? Or there's, we know that there's a part of us, there's a part of us that rebels against God because we think we know better. We think we got it figured out. We, 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 we really do think that we know a better way to do it or that we're smarter. How, can you imagine? Isn't it interesting that sometimes we may not say to God that we're smarter, but we actually act like we are. 
Like, like God says, do it this way. And we're like, that's a good idea, God. But what about this? <laughs> right? Like, I mean, come on. We all have done it where God tells us to do it. And we're like, yeah, that's great. But I have this way of doing it. And God is so gracious. He is. He, he, he'll be like, all right, you, you do you. And it never turns out like we hope it will. It's all, like I was thinking about, it, you know, in Israel, they wanted a king. And God's like, no, I don't, you don't need a king. You have me. And they're like, no, but we really need a king. Everybody else has a king. You know what he says? Okay, here's your king. You're not going to like it, but here's your king. And sometimes it just, he's so gracious to us. He's like, all right, well, then you learn the lesson. Because you're stiff-necked is what he calls the Israelites full of themselves or pride and that's what happens to us is we start to believe that what we're doing only happens because we're doing it like what i've created how much i make the job i have the car i drive you know whatever it is we start to actually believe that we did it and that it's mine and god says hold the phone cletus Hold the phone. Who, who gave you the ability to think? Like, did you make your own brain? Like, you didn't make a brain. You might have exercised that brain and became a little smarter, but God gave you that brain. Some of you have really strong biceps. Some of you don't. And some of you use those biceps to do things. Some of you don't use your biceps to do things. You use your brain. Because you don't want to use your biceps. Right? God gave that to you. Everything you have is a gift. Your ability to learn, your ability to earn, your ability to do whatever it is you're doing. God gave it to you. He's the owner of it. He created it. He gifted it to you. And he says, here, I love you. Use this. But make sure you use it for the right purpose. Make sure you live by the principles I've told you to live by. Because if you don't, then you'll experience it your way, not my way. And God's way is always better than my way. Come on now. Listen to what the psalmist says. Psalms 24, 1 says this. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. And everything. Everybody say everything. Everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. God created it all and God is the giver of it and so my understanding and accepting of ownership is directly tied to my dedication to give to God what is rightfully God's let me say it this way a little different your perspective on ownership determines your posture of obedience your perspective on ownership determines your posture of obedience let me illustrate so there's a really famous person coming to town and i'm supposed to pick him up from the airport okay well i don't want to pick him up in my car because my car is nasty right but i know somebody that has a really nice car okay i go to that person and i say hey can i borrow your car like, I'm picking up this famous person, and I don't want to just pull up in some janky car. I want to try and bless him. So can I borrow your car? And this person, being a very generous person, says, hey, I'd love to let you borrow my car. And so they say, here are the keys. But I have one thing. Here's the keys. Can you not eat in it? Like, I just don't want anybody eating in it. I, I, you know, I've been keeping it clean, and, and I don't like the way food can smell. And so you say, absolutely, deal. I'm on my way to the airport. And all of a sudden, you ever have a hunger pain? You get a hunger pain and you're just kind of like, hmm, we should swing through McDonald's. We should, we should you know, we should, we should go to a Taco Bell, you know, grab ourselves a taco and try to eat it driving down the road. I mean, lettuce won't go anywhere, I promise. 
right? Ah, I'm going to stop by this Chinese restaurant and get some fried rice. Try to eat the fried rice as I'm going down the, you know, it's going to be great. And then all of a sudden you're putting that fry in your mouth because you grab three or four and you throw them right up here and it just, one just falls. You know what I'm talking about? And it goes to the place of doom. The black hole, never to be seen again. And you're like, oh no, how do we get that? And they don't have the space protectors, you know. And so it goes right down there to the bottom. And you're like, I don't know what to do. And you've got all this, you know, this oil and grease. And it's getting all over the steering wheel, you know. And you're just kind of touching dials and licking your fingers and getting all the good salt off. And it's just great, right? You get there, pick the guy up, take him to the hotel. And then you go back to your friend's house and you say, hey, I got your car. Thanks for letting me borrow it. Appreciate it. And you give him the keys back and you leave. Then you get a phone call and your friend's like, what in the world did you do to my car? I got in that thing and it smelled like trans fat. (laughs) It was everywhere. It was horrible. I mean, what kind of person takes a car that they don't own and treats it like that? Some of us are treating the things of God the car of God, like a rental car. Come on now, you know what, you ever, dri- you ever drove a rental? Come on, you drive a rental a little different than your own car. That's why I'll never buy a rental car. I'm like, I'm not, like, you don't know what happened to that thing. But I'm just saying, like, it, some of us are treating it that way. Like, God tells us to take care of it. God gives us very specific instructions and says, do this, do that. Don't do that. And what happens is that we say to God, well, sorry. Sorry? What do you mean? I mean, God will forgive you, of course. But when you come back to ask for that car again, he'd be like, "Mm, I don't know. I don't know if I want to give you that car because I'm not sure you're going to do it what I asked you to do. You know when the Bible says that if you're faithful with little, God will give you much? You ever heard that? If if you're not faithful with little, Roman, if if you can't eat the French fries, if you can stop eating the French fries in God's car, right? If you you can't do the little stuff, he's not going to give you the good stuff. He's not going to give you the big stuff. And no, look, God is a principled being. And we shouldn't be mad at him for that. We should actually be happy that he does that. Because that means he's, he's consistent. In a world that's inconsistent, God is consistent. God is the one creating order in our lives. And so we thank God for it. But we have to make sure that when God tells us to do something, we do it. And, in, and when, it comes, when it comes to this issue of blessing, when it comes to the issue of generosity and giving, God has been absolutely clear with his instructions. Now, we can put our head in the sand and act like it didn't happen. But that doesn't change the fact that God's been clear. And for the believer in the room, you need to hear me today. For the unbeliever in the room, hey, you got a pass right now. But if you've agreed, if you've agreed that Jesus is Lord and he's worthy of your life, then friends, you don't get a pass. God is interested in helping you. And the scariest thing is that somehow we'll be saved, but we won't be blessed. I, that's a scary thought, isn't it? That we, that we live our life in that way. I don't want that for you and I don't want that for me. And so my heart is that we grab hold of this today and that we would recognize that ownership, really understanding ownership helps us understand how tied we are to our dedication to give him what is rightfully his, which we know is the tithe. And we'll talk more about that. But then in addition to that, everything that God gives us is this gift. It belongs to him. And you know what he wants from us? He wants us to actually steward it well. And so the the key here, the first is to make sure we understand it belongs to him. The second, listen, the second we have to understand is that he wants us to steward it wisely. Everything that God has given us, God wants us to steward wisely. That's why like sometimes, you know, people talk about budgets. That's why sometimes people talk about savings. That's why sometimes people talk about don't being overextended. You know, all that kind of stuff. All that matters. 
Because if God, listen, let me show it this way. You imagine having a barrel and I'm pouring water in the barrel. But you notice at the bottom of the barrel, there's a leak. Yes? And I keep pouring water. Well, what's going to happen? The water is going to leak out the bottom. And some of us have a leak because of the way we're stewarding God's blessings. We want it to overflow because God promises it will. But the problem is we haven't plugged the leak. And the leak may be just simply as you need a budget. You, you might need to stop spending money you don't have. You know? You know what it feels like. The, the power of a credit card. Isn't it fun? Come on now. Woo! I love to go into a store with a credit card, especially if it's somebody else's. I'm like the government, you know? I'm like the government. I love to spend your money. But imagine, I mean, just there's power in it. But then you get the bill and there's a leak and it leaks and it keeps leaking. And you're going, God, why doesn't my barrel overflow? He's like, stop the leak and it will. If you'll steward what I've given you, it will. God will give you more than enough. Why? Because you're cute? No. God will give you more than enough because he wants you to share. God blesses you to be a blessing to the world. The world should see believers in Jesus Christ as the most generous people on the planet because we're not tied to the money. We're not thinking, oh no, what if I do this? No, because we know God is for us. We know God is with us. And even if I empty my bank account, God is still with me. That I can be free of the mighty dollar. I can be free of the treasures that bind us or the things that I think or the fear that I get because I gave something. You can get free from all of this when you get this stuff right. And so we got to steward it well. And that just simply means to be a manager. You got to manage it well. Whatever God gives you, you got to manage it well. So I want to kind of zero in on an idea as I, as I get close to closing that I really want us to get today. Uh, and, and, and I think it's going to help you in a variety of ways. But basically, I want to talk about the difference between calling and assignment. Now, at first, that might seem weird as to what are you, where are you going with this, but just stick with me. Every believer, if you're a believer today, every believer in Jesus Christ has a calling. Everyone. Every believer in Jesus Christ has an assignment. But what's the difference? Let me zero in. A calling is something that is universal to all followers of Jesus. And it's a commitment to knowing God and making him known. Like all of us, if you're a follower of Jesus today, that is your calling. That is your calling in life. Wherever you go, it's portable. It goes with you everywhere. Your job is to know God and to make him known. Our job is to know God and make him more famous than me. My job is to make him famous above all. That is my calling. And that is your calling if you call yourself a follower of Jesus. But there's a difference between calling and assignment. Assignment is something that's very specific to the way you live and act and function today. So for example, you might be a banker. You might be a nurse. You might be a teacher. That might be your assignment. You might be a pastor. You might be a daycare worker. I mean, I don't know. You, whatever you are, you have an assignment there. And now, in that assignment, you have a calling. So wherever you are within that assignment, your job is to know God and make him known. So wherever you are, whether it's in the hospital or at the business or whatever, your job is to, to know God and to make him known. But your assignment is very specific. Now, what's the point? Why am I getting into this? I actually think that'll help some of you because some of you have been confused about what you're calling and assignment and all that, all that kind of stuff. And where's God in the midst of that? Because I think God gives us a lot of freedom with our assignments. He does not give us freedom with our calling, but he absolutely gives us a lot of freedom with our assignments. And your assignments oftentimes are connected to how he designed you and made you. Like there are just skill sets, certain things you're good at, you know, talents, you know, spiritual gifts, all that stuff can get wrapped up in that personality. All that gets wrapped up in your assignment. But the reason I'm talking about this is I want to zero in on this idea around calling, being universal. All of us, all of us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, all of us 
have a particular calling. What's the point? Here's the point. That if we all have a particular calling, where does the church fit within that? Okay? Like if we all have a calling, and our job is to know God and make him known, then where does the church fit within that? Why is why are there so many churches and why do pastors care about all this? Why are they even talking about it? You know, what's the deal? Well, here's what I want you to see. In John chapter 3, verse 27 through 29, we read some words from John the Baptist. Now, I don't know if you know who John the Baptist was, but John the Baptist was a forerunner to Christ. He was the one that actually was like, hey, I know that Christ is coming. He's, he's on his way. Uh, he'll be here soon. My job is to announce it. My job is to be like, he's coming. And then eventually what happens is he sees him and he says, hey guys, I just need you to know that's the guy. Matter of fact, that's the guy. Uh, I'm not the guy, but I, that's the guy. And that guy is the lamb of God and he's gonna take away the sins of the world. That's what John the Baptist did. And in this particular passage of scripture, he's being asked some questions and he answers this way. Look what he says. He says, John replies, no one can, no, I'm sorry, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. That seems to kind of relate to my first point. You know what I'm saying? Like God bringing, he's the belong, he, he gives it, he's the guy. So nothing comes to us except from God. He gives it from heaven. Verse 28, you yourselves know how plainly I told you. He's like, I'm not the Messiah. I'm the guy that came before him. He says, I'm only here to prepare the way for him. So he's not the guy, but here's the guy. Verse 29, it is the bridegroom, everybody say bridegroom, who marries the bride. Okay, let me explain this to you. The bridegroom is Jesus, the one that has come who now is married to the bride. Well, who's the bride? The church. So, so, so what am I saying? Jesus established the church to be his bride on the planet. And Christians are supposed to be a part of the bride and we move out from the bride and we move from this place to this place to this place in groups called brides all over the world. And that is what God established. That is God's plan. And that's why you have pastors and people doing these kinds of things. And so here's my point. What's the big deal? We all have a calling. Know God, make him known. But you know what else? We have a calling to do. Take care of God's bride. Take care of Jesus's bride. Can you imagine if Jesus gives us his bride and we neglect it? This is where this sermon is going to get real. All right? Can you imagine neglecting the very thing that God established? See, in God's economy, it is the responsibility of every believer to fuel and fund and care for the bride. I don't know if you know that, but it is. The scripture is so clear on this matter. I want to say this negatively first. We will not experience the blessings of God by neglecting his bride. We will not experience the blessings of God by neglecting his bride. Now I say that, and you may even agree with it, but it's hard, isn't it? Especially when we know there have been times in our life that we've neglected the bride. And truthfully, we've probably all done it. We've all participated on that in some level. But, but, but I'm trying to get us to press through whatever we feel about that to get to the principle. Because if we can change our perspective, if we can start to believe that God owns it all and actually dedicate what is his back to him, like, and return it back to him, and we can start to steward exactly what he's given us in a way that is wise, you know what happens? Exactly what God says will happen. 
you will experience a blessing that is well beyond your ability to even contain it. See, our perspective on giving and tithing and stewardship changes immensely when we understand that the church is the visible manifestation of God's bride. Woo! That's a whole different... It's not just some institution. It's not just something that we look at and go, what is wrong with them people? It's not a thing that's just buildings that are beautiful and, and empty. No, 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 no. It's the exact manifestation of God in this world. It's his bride. Whoo! I don't know. Y'all don't seem excited about that. Jesus is like, hey, y'all, come take care of my bride. Hmm. And as believers, we have that calling. We have a calling. We have a calling to know God, make him known, but also take care of his bride. And can you imagine? Jesus saying, hey, take care of my bride. And you say, no. That's scary. Some of us may never say it out loud, but we do it with our actions. Did you know? Can I give you some numbers? Is that okay? Let me give you some numbers. You guys are smart people. The body of Christ, which makes up the bride in the United States, earned an estimated of 5.2 trillion in 1998. 1998, 5.2 trillion. So since then, it's probably grown. And the total amount given in the United States was 92 billion, which whew, you're like, whoa, 92 billion. It's a lot of money. The amount given is 1.7% of the amount earned. See the problem? Come on now. Do you see it? So you, we accumulated $5.2 trillion. We gave $92 billion, But that is the sum total of 1.7% of the amount. Let me read a couple other thoughts. Only 5%, and this is of, of Christians, only 5% tithe. Some have suggested it's lower. And 80% of Americans only give 2% of their income. The average giving by, a, by adults who attend U.S. Protestant churches is about $17 a week. Do the math. 37% of regular church attendees and evangelicals don't give money to the church. Some of you are like, please give me some good news. Here's some good news. Here's some good news. 24% of people who attend Elevation Church give regularly. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're tithing, but they're giving regularly. I think that's great. Well, that's an amazing number, 24%. Here's the bad news for all you mathematicians out there. That means that 76% don't give regularly. They might give occasionally or not at all. Now, earlier I said that I'm preaching this message and it's not something I want from you. And I still mean it. I really do. You know why? Because the blessing of God is on this house. Like he just is. The blessing of God is on this house. And the reason I know it is, is because we tithe. Like as a church, we tithe on our income or on our contributions. So, so I know for an absolute fact that God has blessed this church and continues. And you know what's interesting though, is like this year, over last year, we probably will bring in around $100,000 less than we brought in last year and we're still going to finish in the black. Now, I mean, seriously, we will still finish in the black. Now, some of that is because I've got smart people leading the church. You know, we budget things, we manage things. But the reason that is, friends, is because the blessing of God is on this house. And that's what I want for you, is that even in lean years, even when inflation is 20%, God will still show up. 
And if you think, if you think that somehow you're going to rob God and he's going to bless you, you are sorely mistaken, friend. And I know that this is straight and strong. I told you, I warned you, but it's so true. You will always be better with 90% because 90% will be blessed. If you try to live on 100, it will be cursed. And you don't want that. You don't want it. I don't want it. You don't want it. Come on, everybody. Say, I don't want it. <laughs> so let me be clear. And I'll talk about this over the next few weeks. The blessing is attached to the tithe. Write that down. Pencil it in in your Bible. The blessing is attached to the tithe. God set it up that way. Not me, God. Let me read something to you out of Malachi. Malachi chapter three, verse seven through 10. Let me show you. Return to me. Return to me and I will return to you. What, what is he saying? God is speaking to the people of Israel who have left him. What does that mean? That, that they aren't doing what he told them to do. And so he says to them, hey, return to me and I'll return to you and we will come together on this. He says, but you ask, well, how are we to return? That's a great question. How are we supposed to return? Verse eight clarifies. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. And now they're kind of taken back by that. Wouldn't you be taken back by that? And so they kind of stumble back a little bit. And this is what he says. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And he says, in the tithes and the offerings. Look, look, look at the language. You are under a curse. Your whole nation. Do you see how it, it's even collective? He says, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And then he says this, this is where it gets good. He says, bring the whole tithe, not part of the tithe, not 1%, not 2%, bring the whole 10th part, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the church, that there may be food in my house. Why do we need food in the house? So we can help people, both spiritually, physically. We're, that's why. And then look what he says, test me in this. Remember I talked about the testing? Test me in this, which we'll talk about. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And this is the best part. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. Do you see it? That there will not be room enough to store it. Woo! Come on. I hope that that excites you. I don't know if it does, but man, wouldn't it be nice to have an overflow in your life? And if we'll start to figure out that it all belongs to him and we'll dedicate ourselves to do what he's told us to do and we'll discipline ourselves to do what he's told us to do, all of a sudden you'll plug the leak and your barrel will begin to overflow. And that is what God wants for you. And as we go through this series, I hope you grab hold of this revelation because I, wouldn't it be amazing if I get everybody in this church blessed? Wouldn't it be amazing? Imagine what we could do. I want to invite the band forward as we close. And I wanted to share a little bit more as they come up, but I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Hezekiah. Hezekiah uh, was a king of Israel. And uh, Hezekiah became a king when he was 25 years old. Now, the interesting thing about Hezekiah is he had a dad who was also king, and his name was uh, Haziah, and, um, or Hazai, A-H-A-Z. Is that what it is? Ahaz? Is that how you say that? Thank you, Christy. His name was A-H-A-Z. Pronounce it however you want. But Hezekiah's dad uh, did not follow God. 
Matter of fact, the Bible would describe him as a wicked king, that he didn't honor the Lord. And what's interesting about Hezekiah's life and his story is that he didn't know that Israel was being disobedient. Like he became king and had no idea what the principles of God were. Get that. Because he was raised by a dad who didn't teach him. So this is what's so amazing about this story. So he comes to the kingship at 25 and he starts to rule. And somebody in his kingdom, in his court, I guess, find a scroll and they bring the scroll to the king because they read it and they're like, oh my, this is, this is different than what we're doing. <laughs> so, so he literally brings the word of God to King Hezekiah and he reads it and he's torn. Like he's, he's completely like dumbfounded. He's like, oh my goodness, Where, what have we done? What did my dad do? And he, and he looks around and he sees all of these idols. He sees the snake, the golden snake that people are worshiping and other animals that they're worshiping, the sacrifices that are being made. His dad even closed the temple, boarded it up. Don't even come. And as he reads it, he starts to figure out, wait, we, are, we have gone way far away from God. And so he calls people back and he says, we got to get rid of these idols. We got to destroy these high places. We got to get rid of this stuff. And matter of fact, we're opening the house of God again. We're going to teach the people what God's word says. And we're going to repent and we're going to give and we're going to do what God has called us to do. And what happens is the people of Israel and Judah, it's so cool. They see it. They respond to it because I truly believe, I really do. I think people want God. I really do. I think we're wired to want him. And when someone gives it to you and, the, and, and you see it and the Holy Spirit's there and it's like, oh, okay. And that's what happened. The people of God are starting to come and they start to bring a 10th part of their animals, a 10th part of their farming and their, their produce and a 10th part of their treasures. And, you, and this is the best part. Like they start to do it and it's coming at such a, uh, an amount that the Bible uses this language that they started to pile it up in heaps heaps and, and as they kept bringing them the, the heap got heapier you know what I'm saying it went from little heap to big heap and it became so heapy that, that they had to find a place to store it that was bigger because it was overflowing they couldn't contain it. And this is so great. The, the priest says it this way. His name is Isaiah, the high priest. He's from the family of Zadok. He says this. Since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. Do you ever wonder how you'll have enough? You trust God and you'll have enough. It says they had enough and more. They had enough. You want enough? Trust God. Honor him with the tithe. You'll have enough. And in addition to the enough, you'll have more. More to spare. Because look what he says. He said there was so more to spare. Plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed his people and all of this, all of this is left over. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the people of God catching this? That this revelation gets deep into your heart and all of a sudden the people of God start to do what God told them to do. Our budget's around $700,000. I would estimate that our budget would probably go to 2 million based on the amount of people that go to this church. Can you imagine? Overnight. Imagine what we could do with that. Imagine the people we could help. Imagine the lives that could be changed and saved and delivered 
Imagine the same thing that's happening to you or happened to you could happen to somebody else because we just got real serious about God's economy and doing it his way. And we pushed back all the fear. We pushed back all the junk that keeps us from it. And we just said, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm going all in. I trust you. I trust you. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word, how it shapes us, and challenges us. Oh, Lord is so good. Father, I just want to pray for the person here today that's receptive. Right where you are, if you would say, this is a word for me, you just say to the Lord, God, I receive it. By faith, I receive it. Will you help me? Will you help me to live it out? For the person in the room that If you're honest, there's a barrier here. Could be a barrier of fear. Could be a barrier of the church. Maybe misuse something in your past. Could be a barrier of, of something else. I don't know. But God forbid you don't move towards a principle of God because of a wound. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would free people from wounds that keep them from the blessing that God wants to bring into their life. Father, we're excited. We're excited to see you create heaps and heaps that there would be more to spare, more left over, overflowing our barrel that we might know you better and make you known and take care of your bride. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, hey, um, I want to invite you to stand. Invite our prayer team to come forward as well. And I wonder if there's anything that's on your heart that you need prayer for. There are people available to pray with you down here at the front. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just feel like I need to do some business personally with God. And so I'll come down here and pray just at the front. Maybe I won't even have anybody pray for me necessarily. I'll just come down and pray and give it to God. Maybe you want to do that as well. But as we sing this last song, I just encourage you to allow God to meet you here. I, I think God is speaking. I don't know if you believe that. But God is speaking, but we got to have ears to hear him. And I think after the word of God is preached, that our ears are open. Our hearts are more tender. Our eyes are a little bit more open. And so I just believe the Holy Spirit wants to interact with us right now, like during this moment. And so as we sing this song and as we just enjoy worship, I just invite you to say to God, God, would you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to me now? I just need to see, I need to hear from God today. So just invite the Spirit of God to speak to you as we sing this song. Let's worship together.